The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome old-time radio lovers to the Boxcar 7-Eleven old-time radio pod. I am Bob Camardella, your host, and for the next hour or so, your guide, as we travel back in time, back before TV was, to the golden age of radio. The world's greatest short stories features dramatizations of classic short stories like Telltale Heart, The Pickwick Papers, The Little Wife and more. The announcer claims that the short stories in this program are those stories that constitute our rich heritage of excellent entertainment all blessed with a touch of genius. These are the classic short stories that you promised yourself that you would read. Put down the book and turn on the radio because these renditions of class literature are top notch. I live, or, or did live I should say, at 5226th Street in New York, along with eight or ten other boarders, in a house which enjoyed the reputation for being haunted. Yes, haunted. My landlady had rented it, and we'd all moved in rather anticipating the unnatural noises and opening doors and fleet-footed furniture that had been sworn to by previous renters. But after a month of psychological excitement, it was with the utmost dissatisfaction that we were forced to acknowledge that nothing in the remotest degree approaching the supernatural had manifested itself. Once the black butler had asseverated that his candle had been blown out by some invisible agency while he was undressing himself for the night, but as I have more than once discovered this colored gentleman in a condition with, when one candle must have appeared to him like two, I thought it possible that by going a step further in his potations, he might have reversed this phenomenon and seen no candle at all where he ought to have beheld one. Well, things were in this state when an accident took place, so awful and inexplicable in its character that my reason fairly reels at the bare memory of the occurrence. It was on the 10th of July. After dinner was over, I repaired with my friend Dr. Hammond to the garden to smoke my evening pipe. Independent of certain mental sympathies which existed between the doctor and myself, we were linked together by a vice. We both smoked opium. We knew each other's secret and respected it. We enjoyed together that wonderful expansion of thought, that marvelous intensifying of the perceptive faculties, that unimaginable spiritual bliss which I would not surrender for a throne and which I hope that you will never, never taste. Well, on this evening, we lit our large meerschaums filled with fine Turkish tobacco in the core of which burned a little black nut of opium that, like the nut in the fairy tale, held within its narrow limits wonders beyond the reaches of kings. For some unaccountable reason... Our talk constantly diverged into the dark and lonesome places where a continual gloom brooded. This went on for perhaps 30 minutes when I broke off the conversation, the character of which was too unearthly for me. I went to my room and immediately to bed after turning down my gas until nothing but a little blue point of light glimmered on top of the tube. The room was practically in total darkness. But sleep touched not my bed, for over and over in my mind I turned the grotesque talk I had just completed. While I was lying still as a corpse, hoping that by perfect physical inaction I would hasten mental repose, an awful incident occurred. A something dropped, as it seemed, from the ceiling plumb upon my chest, and the next instant I felt two bony hands encircling my throat, endeavoring to choke me. The suddenness of the attack, instead of stunning me, strung every nerve to its highest tension. My body acted from instinct before the brain had time to realize the terrors of my position. In an instant, I wound my arms around the creature and squeezed it with all the strength of despair against my chest. In a few seconds, the bony hands that had fastened on my throat loosened their hold, and I was free to breathe once more. Then commenced a struggle of awful intensity, immersed in the most profound darkness, totally ignorant of the nature of the thing by which I was so suddenly attacked, finding my grasp slipping every moment, by reason it seemed to me, of the entire nakedness of my assailant, and bitten by sharp teeth in the shoulder and neck and chest and having every moment to protect my throat against a pair of sinewy, agile hands which my utmost efforts could not confine. But at last, after a silent, deadly, exhausting struggle, I got my assailant under by a series of incredible efforts of strength. And once pinned with my knee and what I made out to be its chest, I knew that I was a victor. I rested for a moment to breathe. I heard the creature beneath me panting in the darkness and I felt the violent throbbing of a heart. It, apparently, was as exhausted as I was. That was one comfort. 
With a large handkerchief I had placed under my pillow, I tied the creature's arms. Then, never losing my hold for an instant, I slipped from the bed to the floor, dragging my captive with me. Quickly as possible, I turned up the gas full and turned to look at my captive. I cannot even attempt to give any definition of my sensations the instant after I turned on that gas. I suppose that I must have shrieked with terror, for less than a minute afterward, my room was crowded with the inmates of the house. I shudder now as I think of that awful moment. I saw nothing. Yes, I had one arm firmly cast around a breathing, panting, corporeal shape, and my other hand gripped with all its strength a throat as warm and as apparently fleshy as my own, and yet with this living substance in my grasp, with its body pressed against my own, and all the bright glare of the large jet gas, I absolutely beheld nothing, not even an outline or a vapor. Just then, Hammond entered my room at the head of the household. As soon as he beheld my face, which I supposed must have been an awful sight to look at, he hastened forward, saying, Great heaven, Harry, what's happened? I shouted to him, Hammond, come here. This is awful. I've been attacked in bed by something or other, which I have hold of, but I can't see it. I can't see it. Hammond, doubtless struck by the unfeigned horror expressed in my countenance, made one or two steps forward with an anxious yet puzzled expression. He whispered to me, Harry, you've been smoking too much opium. I swear to you, Hammond, that this is no vision. Don't you see how it shakes my whole frame with its struggles? If you don't believe me, convince yourself. Feel it. Touch it. Hammond advanced and laid his hand on the spot I indicated. A wild cry of horror burst from him. He had felt it. In a moment, he had discovered somewhere in my room a, a long piece of cord and was the next instant winding it and knotting it about the body of the unseen being that I clasped in my arms. I was utterly exhausted, and I gladly loosed my hold. There was Hammond, twisting the cord tightly around the vacant space. I never saw a man look so thoroughly stricken with awe. We picked up the thing and put it on the bed. The timbers of the bed creaked, the deep impression marked itself distinctly on the pillow and the bed itself. We remained silent for some time, listening to the low, irregular breathing of the creature in the bed and watching the rustle of the bedclothes as it impotently struggled to free itself from confinement. The rest of the household had fled the room. Dr. Hammond spoke. Harry, this is awful. Aye, aye, it's awful. But, but not unaccountable. What do you mean? Well, let's reason a little, Harry. Here is a solid body which we touch, but we cannot see. The fact is so unusual that it strikes us with terror. But uh, take a piece of pure glass. It is tangible and transparent. A certain chemical coarseness is all that prevents its being so entirely transparent as to be totally invisible. It is not theoretically impossible, mind you, to take a glass which shall not reflect a single ray of light. A glass so pure and homogeneous in its atoms that the rays from the sun will pass through it as they do through the air, refracted but not reflected. We do not see air, and yet we feel it. Well, that's all very well, Hammond, but these are inanimate substances. Glass doesn't breathe, air doesn't breathe. This thing has a heart, and it palpitates, a will that moves it, lungs that play and inspire and respire. Oh, but you forget the phenomena of which we've so often heard of late. That the meeting is called spirit circles. Invisible hands have been thrust into the hands of those persons round the table. Warm, fleshy hands that seem to pulsate with mortal life. What? Do you think, then, that th this thing is a... I don't know what it is. But please the gods, I will, with your assistance, thoroughly investigate it. This we did. The next day we decided to take a cast of the creature. This would give us a solid figure and satisfy all our wishes. First we administered chloroform to stop its activity. In three minutes we were enabled to remove the fetters from the creature's body and the plaster of Paris applied. In five minutes more, we had a mold. And before evening, a round facsimile of the mystery. It was shaped like a man. Distorted, uncouth, and horrible. But still a man. It was small, not over four feet and some inches in height. And its limbs revealed a muscular development that was unparalleled. Its face surpassed in hideousness anything I had ever seen. 
It was the physiognomy of what I should fancy a ghoul might have. It looked as if it was capable of feeding on human flesh. Having satisfied our curiosity, we bound everyone in the house to secrecy. And it became a question, what was to be done with our enigma? It was impossible that such an awful being should be let loose upon the world. And I confess that I would have gladly voted for the creature's destruction. But who would shoulder the responsibility? Who would undertake the execution of this horrible semblance of a human being? Day after day, this question was deliberated gravely. The most singular part of the affair was that we were entirely ignorant of what the creature's creature habitually fed on. Everything in the way of nutriment that we could think of was placed before it, but was never touched. It was awful to stand by day after day and see the clothes toss and hear the hard breathing and know that it was starving. Ten, twelve days, a fortnight passed, and it still lived. The pulsations of the heart, however, were daily growing fainter, and it now nearly ceased. It was evident that the creature was dying for want of sustenance. While this terrible life struggle was going on, I felt miserable. I couldn't sleep. Horrible as the creature was, it was pitiful to think of the pangs it was suffering. At last it died. Hammond and I found it cold and stiff one morning in the bed. The heart had ceased to beat, the lungs to inspire, so we hastened to bury it in the garden. It was a strange funeral. The dropping of that viewless corpse into the damp hole. The cast of its form I gave to a museum on 10th Street in New York. As I am on the eve of a long journey from which I may not return, I have drawn up this narrative of an event the most singular that has ever come to my knowledge. Much can be found in the works of Fitzjames O'Brien. He, with so much of Ireland in his name and so much of America in his heart, much can be found to compare with Edgar Allan Poe. For O'Brien delighted in adapting to fiction the strange and unworldly figments of an active mind. Very little, if any, however, of Poe's unutterable morbidity is evident, which makes him a writer of unreality, but with no, no phantasmagoria. O'Brien's native Irish wit and joviality gave him popularity among the bohemian spirits of New York in the 1850s, and among the writers, his ability brought him high esteem. On the declaration of the Civil War, he obtained a commission, fought, and was fatally wounded in February of 1862, dying in April of that year. We hope to present again soon some samples from his pen. But next week, we turn to another unusual story. We review Frank R. Stockton's a tale of negative gravity. Try to be with us. Until then, good night and good reading. <laughs>